This all happened a few months ago when I met Veronica at a mutual friend's house party. We hit it off immediately as a beer pong team, so she gave me her Snapchat and we spent the next week exchanging videos. At first, it was casual, mostly memes and just videos of whatever we were doing at the time with goofy filters over it. Like, I sent Veronica a snap of me cooking breakfast and then slapped a psychedelic lens over my face that made me look like a hippie. After about a week, Veronica started sending me flirtier snaps. Nothing wild, just stuff like blowing me a kiss at the end of a video or using a heart emoji filter. I was vibing with that because Veronica was gorgeous. Dark hair, dark eyes, and slim. We'd probably exchanged a hundred snaps before I saw the face in the background. I was laying on the couch playing Elden Ring when I received the snap. Hey Troy, what do you think of my new earrings? Veronica asked in a video. She was sitting at her kitchen table with some kind of pirate filter on. It added big fake gold earrings as well as an eye patch. Just as the snap was ending, I sat up. There was something in the background of the video in a shadowy way at the end of the kitchen. The snap was gone before I had a chance to think to screenshot it. It was hard for me to tell exactly what it was in the background due to the bad lighting and the filter but it looked like a face on the wall. The face was ugly, old, but hard to make out in detail because it was dark. It was a man, completely bald, with thick, hard features and eyes that seemed to look right through you. His mouth was clenched shut. I thought there might even have been a red streak on his chin. I decided to snap Veronica back ASAP. Hey, did you recently install a creepy portrait in your kitchen? I asked. Creepy dude was mean mugging me in your snap. I added an LOL filter and sent the message. Veronica got back to me immediately. Not sure what you're talking about, dudeski, she said while shooting a quick video tour of her kitchen. You're weird, but luckily you're cute. I felt the blood go cold in my veins. Veronica's snap showed me the wall where I thought I'd seen the portrait of the man, but instead of a painting, there was a window. Hey, I'm being serious now, okay? I snapped back. I think a man might have been looking in through your kitchen window. Veronica looked nervous and a little angry in her reply. She didn't bother using any filters. Troy, if you're messing with me, that's not okay. Don't try to scare me. This latest video had Veronica walking around in her living room. All of her curtains were open and I could see the night sky clearly around her house. I also noticed a shadow outside in her yard. This time, I was fast enough to screenshot the end of the video and I sent it back to Veronica. She sent me back a chat instead of a video. Okay, I'm freaking out now a little. She wrote, can you come over? I'd been hoping for an invitation for a while, but not like this. Before I could reply, I got a notification that she sent over a video. I opened it to see her clearly panicked Veronica rushing down her hallway. Troy, I saw somebody outside. They limped between the willow tree out front and went around the side of the house. I'm not sure, but there might have been two shadows out there. I chatted her back. Hey, here's my FaceTime. Give me a call and I'll stay online with you. She called a few moments later from her bedroom. The lights were out and I could see from the screen's glow that Veronica was crying. There's someone outside my room, she whispered. I heard them trying to open the window. Troy, please, please, I'm so scared. Okay, okay, just hold tight, I'm going to. Someone was pounding on Veronica's front door, hitting it hard enough to rattle the window all the way in her bedroom. I heard screaming or shouting. It was muffled and impossible to tell what they were saying. After a moment, the knocking stopped and there was silence. Then Veronica screamed. 
Before I could ask what was wrong, she swiveled her camera to point out of her bedroom window. A man was looking inside, the same man I'd spotted in her kitchen window. His face was pale and up close, clearly streaked with blood on his chin and cheeks. Veronica ripped the curtains shut and began hyperventilating. Hey, hey, listen. You need to stay quiet. Stay hidden. Barricade your bedroom door. Put something heavy against the window, too. Then you need to hang up this call and... No, please, she whispered, breathing harder. Don't leave me. Just for a minute, I promised. You need to call 911. I'll call them too, to make sure we get through. Snap me your address and I'll be on your way over to you. Please hurry. Veronica hung up and I instantly got a notification in the chat. I was already on my way out of the door, sliding my boots on and my jacket. When I connected with 911, the dispatcher confirmed that they were already on the line with Veronica. Since she was talking to a professional, I sent her a quick Snapchat video instead of FaceTiming. Hey, I'm on my way. So are the police. You'll be okay. I said, climbing into my truck. The cops beat me to Veronica's house. There were two squad cars parked at the curb when I pulled into her driveway. There was also a dead man lying in the front yard. He was face down in the grass, an axe still embedded in his back near the top of his spine. As I got closer, I saw the man was bald and very pale. There was one officer standing near the corpse, talking into her radio, and two more at the front porch of the house, trying to calm Veronica down. The first officer started to step to block me, but Veronica caught sight of my approach and came sprinting down the steps. She jumped into my arms and clutched me tight, sobbing so hard I couldn't make out what she was saying. I hugged her back, but my attention was on the body in the yard. I saw the first cop lean over to shine a light in its face. The corpse was definitely the man I'd seen peering into Veronica's window. The stalker. The potential home invader. I doubted Veronica was savage and composed enough to put an axe into his back. So, who killed him? The answer became clear when more police cars arrived but stopped three houses down instead of at Veronica's. When I was finally able to get Veronica to calm down, I let a paramedic look over her while I walked down the street. This time, a cop did stop me at the edge of the yard. A crime scene technician was marking off an open door to the house with black and yellow tape. I was able to see a woman's body lying in the living room floor before they shuffled me away. The rest of the story came out in the paper that week. Veronica's neighbor, a middle-aged couple that just moved in, were brutally murdered the same night she and I were exchanging snaps. The wife died at the scene, but the husband was able to flee and most likely made his way next door to ask for help. Only that family was on vacation so he moved to Veronica's house, creeping in the yard in case the killer was in pursuit, which he was. The man probably tried to get Veronica's attention quietly at first, then started pounding on the door when he realized he was being followed. He ran around to her window when she didn't answer. That's when the killer must have caught up with him and planted an ax in his spine as the man tried to dash across the yard. I know Veronica blames herself for not opening the door, but how could she have known that her stalker was really a victim? Besides, all that might have changed was the police finding three bodies instead of two. This happened about a month ago, but I couldn't decide if I should tell it or not. I'm kind of a paranoid person and didn't know if I was going to deal with something like this again if I talked about it. But since it's been a month and nothing has happened again, I'll share it. English is not my native language, 
so bear with me if I sound weird. I'm a 22-year-old girl from Bulgaria, studying art in another town. I was back home at my parents' house for Christmas vacation. And this happened a little after New Year's. My parents' house is in a tiny village near a big town where I grew up. We moved into the village and now live in a two-story house. I was sitting one night in my room and watching some amazing horror stories by MJV Animations, as I usually do. It was about two o'clock and I was immersed in a scary story, not knowing that I would be living in my own horror story real soon. It started with me receiving a notification from Snapchat that someone had added me. I was kind of confused, but I still opened it and saw that someone with the username Lappy789 added me as a friend. Now, I want to explain why this is weird to me. I hardly use Snapchat. I just have it on my phone for no reason at all. None of my friends used it since Instagram got the story thing, and we all started to use that instead. I have very few friends on Snapchat, and none of them active on it, so I didn't think that it was someone I knew. And I don't even have my location on it, or Bitmoji, or whatever it's called, that I can give away my location or username to people nearby. I don't even know what that thing does, because as I said, I haven't been using Snapchat in a while. I also didn't have my username mentioned anywhere on my social media. Out of curiosity, I added Lappy789 and opened their profile to see if they had a picture or something that I could tell more about this person. There was nothing except their Snapchat score, which was about 7. I set my phone on the desk and started to rewind the video and listening to the parts that I missed while I was distracted by the phone. As I got ready to go back to the video, I got another notification. It was from Lappy789 again, and this time it was a snap. I opened it, and it was a picture of grass taken with a flashlight. I stared at it, all confused, and then typed, What is this? Who are you? Lappy789 received it, then read it, but didn't respond. At this point, I started to ask all of my friends if it was one of them, or if they had given my username to someone, but they all said no. A few seconds later, another snap came, and now it was a picture of what looked like a red tile. Curiosity took over me, and once again I texted, This isn't funny. Who the hell are you? Lappy789 saw my message, but didn't respond. The third snap came, and I was prepared to start screenshotting to show my boyfriend. It was a picture of what looked like a little doorknob, but I couldn't see anything more clearly. I failed to screenshot it at first, so I had to replay the snap. When I was finally done, I went back to the third snap to take a closer look this time. Drops of sweat appeared on my forehead as I realized this doorknob belonged to our backyard gazebo. At this point, I'm slowly grasping that this person is Snapchatting me from my backyard. And by the way, it's not so easy for someone to access our backyard as we have a tall fence. You would have to take your time and scout the place around to find a possible way to climb the fence. It would be even more difficult in the dark, which meant whoever this was had been looking around our house during the day to find a way to get in. I was utterly horrified, and I didn't know what to do for a few moments. Then, I stood up from my desk and ran to turn off all the lights. As my room got dark, I peeked through my window shades to see the backyard. It was very cloudy and a dark night so I couldn't see anything. The fourth snap came, and like last time, I was ready to take a screenshot of it to my boyfriend, who hadn't yet seen my messages. When I opened the snap, I screamed in terror. It was a zoomed in snap of my window shade, the one that he could see me gazing out of. I ran out of my room, not knowing what to do. For some strange reason, I didn't want to wake up my dad and tell him what was going on. My mom was sleeping downstairs on the couch, and I was upstairs. 
I tried to figure out how to open the super loud and screechy door to our terrace without waking up my parents. Even if I was scared, I still wanted to find the intruder who was pulling off this freaky prank to me. I battled with the door for about 30 seconds, but I managed to open it quietly and carefully stepped outside to look. I still didn't see anyone. I looked and I looked, trying to stay low as I could so that the snapper wouldn't see me. But I couldn't see anyone lurking in the backyard. I was coming down from the terrace when I received another snap from Lappy789. As I opened it, the blood in my veins ran cold. It was a picture of my mom sleeping on the couch taken from inside the house. This freak was now inside my house. As shocked and terrified as I was, I rushed downstairs in complete panic. Dad, Dad, there's someone inside our house. Dad, call the cops. As I came downstairs, screaming frantically, my mom woke up and she saw our main door was wide open. It seemed like we forgot to lock the main door that night and my mom passed out on the couch without knowing the door was unlocked. My dad came out of the room and I told him everything while showing the snaps. My mom and I were both hyperventilating at this point. My dad called the cops and went out, taking his gun to scavenge the area. After checking everywhere, my dad came back inside and said that he didn't find anyone. The cops came and they too inquired our neighbors and us about the whole incident but no lead took place on the matter. I could hardly sleep that night. Every five seconds, I kept checking for new snaps from this unknown account, but Lappy789 was gone. I would have been relieved if Lappy789 stayed gone, but unfortunately, he didn't. When I woke up, I found a creepy text from the same account. It read, Had a nice time watching you sleep. Can't wait to see you soon. Goodbye. I immediately blocked the account. I've texted and called all my friends, begged them to confess if it was one of them, but they all said it wasn't them. I told my boyfriend what happened. He asked everyone he knew, but still nothing. We tried to find the account, but we soon found out that he had deactivated it. There was no one with the name Lappy789 anymore. I had deleted Snapchat and didn't think I'd ever use it again. The next day, I went outside to look around to see if the creep left something behind, and I saw footprints on a little muddy patch. My dad doesn't seem to believe it was the intruder's footprints, saying it was probably one of us, but I'm pretty sure they weren't ours. To this day, I still don't know who it was. I've asked everyone I know, but nothing has ever come out of it. I still wonder what their intentions were. Were they trying to scare me? Were they stalking me? Who were they? How did they find me? I wouldn't know. I just hope I never have to deal with them again. This happened when I was seven years old. I was a very timid girl back then, and the events that transpired that day have stuck with me ever since. I was staying over at a friend's house one Saturday afternoon, and we were both sitting on the couch watching cartoons. For the sake of this story, we'll call my friend Kate. Kate was two years older than me and could be best described as a tomboy. Unlike me, she was tough and didn't hesitate to beat up any boy at school for saying mean things behind her back. At the time, I had a tendency to do whatever Kate told me to, even if I didn't want to do it. Anyways, after watching cartoons for a while, I got hungry, so I left the couch and went into the kitchen to grab a snack. The kitchen was small and had a door that led straight to the backyard, and below it was a little doggy door. Kate no longer had a dog, but the door wasn't removed for some reason. As soon as I stepped into the kitchen doorway, my eyes zeroed in on the doggy door, and I froze. To my absolute horror, 
a grown man with long brown hair was poking his head inside. I couldn't see his face, just the top of his head as he was looking up at the doorknob, probably trying to see if he could reach it. I quickly and quietly ran around the corner to hide. Thankfully, he didn't see me as much as he was too busy trying to squeeze his arm through the door. Kate's parents were out shopping at the time, so we were both home alone with this guy trying to break in. And it was here that I made my first mistake. Instead of calling the police, I ran back to the living room where Kate was and told her about the man. She thought I was joking, so I grabbed her by the hand and pulled her off the couch, then led her back to the kitchen so she could see the man for herself. Sure enough, he was still there. His face was still obscured as he was looking up at the doorknob, but this time he had his whole arm inside the doggy door and tried to reach for the knob. Kate let out a soft whimper before quickly putting her hand over her mouth. It was the first time I saw her look so scared, but she looked back at me. Her fear seemingly went away. She then placed a reassuring hand on my shoulder and put her fingers to her lips to keep me quiet. Don't worry, we're going to teach that creep a lesson he will never forget, she said with a smug grin. I wasn't sure what she was planning. We were two scrawny little girls dressed in tank tops and shorts, not exactly the picture of intimidation, but like an idiot, I agreed to go along with whatever she was up to. Okay, I said. Great, we're going to have to sneak up on this guy. So do what I do and follow me and be quiet, she said before walking into the kitchen with me close behind. Even though we tried our best to be stealthy, our feet squeaked loudly across the floor with every step we took. Kate's mom must have cleaned the floor recently, and since Kate and I were both barefoot, the squeaking was twice as loud. We stopped and looked at each other nervously for a moment thinking we were done for. But fortunately, the man's constant fumbling with the locked door blocked any of the squeaks we made. So by sheer dumb luck, he wasn't alerted of our presence, even though our footsteps were as loud as an incoming freight train. My heart raced as we continued walking forward, getting closer and closer to the intruder. The man hadn't noticed us yet, but he yanked his head and arm out after seemingly giving up on reaching for the knob. Kate sighed in disappointment, but I'd figured he'd be back to try again. She then sat down in front of the doggy door while I sat beside her. As soon as he pokes his head in, we're gonna kick him as hard as we can. Kate snickered as she raised both of her feet off the floor and bent her knees back, preparing them for the kick. I did the same, and we both just stayed in that position, waiting for the man to return. No more than 20 seconds passed before the doggy door flapped open again, and the man popped his head in, this time giving us a good look at his face. We didn't kick. We just sat there, frozen, eyes wide with fear as we tried to comprehend what we were looking at. His face, my God. His face looked like it had all of its skin ripped off, leaving only exposed muscle. The top of his head looked normal enough with the brown hair, but his face was gone. This is not a face we were expecting to see. Looking back, I'm not sure if his skin was actually gone or if he just had a detailed tattoo, which my seven-year-old brain believed to be real. And if it was a tattoo, then damn, it was a good one. The exposed muscles and sinews around his cheekbones looked so lifelike that it left both me and my friend petrified. The man himself was also surprised when he saw us for the first time. He glanced between the two of us completely speechless. And why wouldn't he be? He wasn't expecting to find two little girls waiting for him on the other side of the door, with their bare feet raised in the air, ready to strike mere inches from his face. The entire situation was so surreal. After a minute of awkward silence, as we just looked at each other, 
The man finally smiled at us. And when he did, my friend and I began to quake in fear. As if this guy couldn't get any weirder, his mouth was full of razor sharp teeth, almost as if he were a monster straight out of a horror movie. Then, without warning, he lunged his head forward, mouth wide open like he was ready to bite. Kate and I screamed as we fell back on our backs, yanking our feet away from the man's teeth as they snapped shut. He missed us by mere centimeters, and we weren't about to stick around so he could try again. I quickly scrambled to my feet and bolted out the kitchen. Kate, however, took a little longer to get up, and the man was able to grab her ankle, making her fall to the floor. Looking over my shoulder, I could see Kate screaming as she was being dragged towards the man, who once again had his mouth open, ready to take a bite. Kate started kicking the man's face with her other foot, making him let go for a moment, only to grab her other foot. I raced back into the kitchen, grabbed a few apples that had been sitting on a nearby table, and started throwing them at the man. The man groaned in annoyance as he let my friend go and scrambled out of the doggy door. We could hear his frantic footsteps fading away as he finally left the house. I guess he didn't think breaking in was worth getting pelted by apples. We never told Kate's parents about what happened. I mean, what would we even tell them? A man with no skin on his face and a mouthful of sharp teeth tried to break in and nearly bit off our toes? Her parents would think we were crazy. I don't know if that guy was ever caught, but I hope he never tries this with anyone else. I'll probably never forget that face for as long as I live. My best friend Pamela and I hosted a sleepover at my place last weekend. My parents visited my grandma in Wisconsin, so I had the house to myself. Pamela and I have been best friends since kindergarten. We've done sleepovers many times before, but as this is our final year of high school, we decided to make this one special. And unfortunately, it turned out to be a sleepover to remember for the rest of our lives. Another classmate, Corey, joined us. We turned on some music and started talking about our plans. I was having a conversation with Corey when Pamela said, God, you guys are so boring. Really? Then show us how much fun you are. <laughs> I have an idea. What? Are you guys familiar with the Ouija board thing? You mean calling out to dead people? How old are you, six? It works. You just have to concentrate. Corey rolled her eyes as gesturing it was a dumb plan. Now, I've heard about this thing, but never tried it on my own. I thought for a second, and then said in a confused tone, but I don't have a Ouija board. I can make one, just need a few basic things. So within the next few minutes, Pamela got busy making our Ouija board. She took a piece of cardboard and pasted a white paper on it. Then on the top left, wrote yes, and on the top right, no. In the middle, she wrote the alphabet A to Z, and down under, wrote numerical one through zero, and at the end of the paper, she wrote, goodbye. Whoa, this looks spooky. That's the fun. Get me a glass from the kitchen. Corey went to get a glass, and I sat there thinking, what the hell are we doing? A weird voice kept telling me that we shouldn't be doing this, but I could barely say no to Pamela. Once Corey brought the glass, Pamela took out a half-empty bottle of wine from her backpack. Where'd you get that? Stole it from my dad's cupboard. She filled the glass with wine and drank it in one go. She then filled it again and gave it to Corey. Corey, too, drank it without hesitation. But when she gave me the glass of wine, I felt kind of worried. Pamela, I don't think this is a good idea. Come on, it's just one glass. Yeah, Beth, don't be a chicken. <laughs> they both laughed at me, seeing my hesitation, so I drank it just to get it over with. Pamela turned off the lights of my room. 
The pale moonlight coming from my window was enough to see around. We sat down in a circle and placed the board right in the middle. Pamela lit a small candle to see the letters clearly and placed the glass on the board. Now listen, I'll ask the questions, but first we have to decide who we're going to call. What about Fat Amy? Seriously, Corey? Is that a joke? Come on, don't ruin the fun. That ugly bitch had it coming. Can't disagree with that. <laughs> Pamela and Corey laughed ruthlessly over an unfortunate incident that happened last year. In our class used to be a girl named Amy Sanders. She was overweight and mean kids made fun of her. She usually kept to herself. One day when she was changing in the girls' locker room, someone took her photo and circulated it among the school group. She was so heartbroken and petrified that she drank bleach and died while coughing blood in the girls' bathroom. Nobody deserves to be treated like that. You guys are so mean. Oh God, enough with your lectures, Beth. Can we please start? Are we going to call Amy? Maybe we can ask her about the mysterious photographer. I mean, ghosts know everything. Ghosts aren't real. Let's find out. We all placed our index fingers on the top of the glass and closed our eyes. Pamela said in a low voice, Think about Fat Amy. Imagine her face. Corey and I certainly did as she said. Pamela kept chanting. Amy, if you're out there, talk to us. Amy, are you there? Nothing happened for a while. I was on the verge to give up on this bullshit, but I felt someone breathe on me. What the? I opened my eyes and saw it was Pamela blowing on my face. She and Corey laughed out loud, seeing me get all creeped out. I lost my calm and screamed at them. This isn't funny, guys. Enough. I'm going to bed. Then suddenly, we heard a sound. A sound of a girl weeping. What is that? The sound started to grow louder, as if whoever was crying was now walking towards my room. Pamela, is this one of your pranks? I, I swear I'm not doing anything. We all stood up in fear. Our faces were pale. I know it very well that there was no one else in this house except for the three of us. And even if someone enters, the door alarm will buzz like crazy, identifying a break-in. Our heartbeats got faster as the sound came closer each second. At one point, it was so loud that I could tell someone was standing right on the other side of my bedroom door. My throat was dry. All of our eyes were on the door, waiting for the unknown person to walk in. Suddenly, the sound stopped and the door creaked open. The movement was so slow that I thought my heart would stop at any minute. But as the door opened, we saw nothing but pitch black darkness on the other side of the door. It felt as if a completely different world resided beyond my bedroom door. Oh my God. Pamela and I turned towards the Ouija board left on the ground, following Corey's eyes. And what I saw made my stomach drop. The glass had started to move slowly. With wide eyes, we watched the glass move chronologically. H E L L O. She's here. Is this happening? Amy, is, is this you? The glass moved to yes in one swift motion. Pamela grabbed my hand in fear. She said in a broken voice, we, we better move it to goodbye. But before she could do that, Corey suddenly asked, Who is responsible for your death, Amy? Corey, stop! You're messing with danger. I gotta end this right now. 
What happened next can only be seen in horror movies. Pamela went to grab the glass to move it to goodbye, but something invisible flung her in the air and tossed her to the hard floor like a doll. Her wrist broke and hung like a broken tree branch while she screamed in terrible pain. None of us moved because we knew the same thing would happen to us too if we did. The glass then slowly spelt the name of the person responsible for Amy's death. P. A. M. E. L. A. It was you. Pamela, why? Why did you do that? I swear it was just a prank. I didn't know she was going to kill herself. You have to move the glass to goodbye. You have to end this. Suddenly, a spine-chilling scream took place in the darkness outside my room. And I kid you not, a pair of red eyes surfaced from it. Just eyes. Wide, still, eyelidless eyes. I've never seen anything so scary in my entire life. Corey fainted on the floor before she could speak a word, and Pamela started pleading. Please, Amy, please, I didn't mean to. Forgive me, please. I have come to take you with me. <laughs> a black, shadowy figure started walking towards Pamela while she screamed for her life. At that moment, something hit my senses, and I grabbed the glass on the board, saying, I'm sorry, but goodbye, Amy. The air in the room got sucked in by some invisible hole, and then suddenly, the lights turned on. That was the last time all three of us hung out together. Pamela stopped coming out of her house for a month, and now she moved to New Orleans. Corey is still going to therapy, and I try my best to forget that night like a bad dream. Still, whenever I find myself in a dark room, I can still hear Amy's voice calling out to Pamela. I have come to take you with me. <laughs> My wife Pamela almost gave up on life when our family doctor told her that she would never be able to have children. I could see how her heart shattered into pieces, so we decided to adopt to give our life a new beginning. We traveled to the children's home in Long Island. My colleague gave me the address. The moment we reached the location, an old woman came to greet us. She took us inside the house where we could see children playing and laughing in joy. I was overwhelmed with the moment and started to interact with every kid running around me. While doing so, my eyes went to the long corridor around the living room and I saw Pam standing beside a little boy. They were both standing near the window and watching the views outside. I walked to them and said, Who's this, Pam? Danny and I both love to look out the window, don't we, Dan? Yes, there's so much to see. That was the moment I realized that she had found what she was looking for. We filled out the forms and brought Daniel home. Daniel had wide blue eyes and dark black hair. He was a very calm and quiet kid, which you don't usually see for kids in his age. The entire ride home, he kept staring at the road. He didn't talk unless he was asked to. I don't know why his manners were too mature for his age. One other odd thing was his records. The orphan keeper told us that someone left Daniel on their doorstep when he was just a baby. So basically, they have no idea about his parents or bloodline. But Daniel was adopted twice before, and in both cases, trouble followed him. He was first adopted by a family who abused him and kept him locked in the basement for months. When the cops rescued him, he was found severely malnourished and had wounds all over his body. He was provided with medical care and special attention till he turned four, 
and another family showed interest in adopting him. This time, the orphanage ran a full check on this family, and it was said that they were a lovely couple. But unfortunately, within the next few months, they died in a terrible house fire. Daniel was saved somehow as he hid in the basement. Pam and I both felt bad for him and decided to love him with everything. But the moment he stepped into our house, weird things started to happen. One morning, I woke up very early, probably around 5.30, to go for a run. I was tying my shoelaces standing near the stairs when I heard a sound from the kitchen. I went to the kitchen and saw Daniel washing his hands. When did you wake up? He looked at me like he had seen a ghost. Then suddenly, his face became expressionless and he went back to washing his hands. Once he was done, he wiped his hands on a kitchen towel and walked past me without saying a single word. It all happened so unexpectedly that I didn't know what to say. After he left, I looked at the kitchen sink and found a white feather that probably belonged to a pigeon or some other kind of bird. I also found the back door open. I came outside and searched the entire backyard, expecting something suspicious, but couldn't find anything. I didn't tell Pam about this. Dan behaved as if nothing happened, so I didn't interrogate him any further. Two days later, I took him to the city park so that he could interact with the neighborhood kids. I sat down on the bench and watched him walking to the swing. He was about to sit on one of the swings when a taller kid came and pushed him away. I immediately ran towards him to handle the situation. I was expecting Daniel to fight back, but instead, he slowly got up, wiped the dirt off of his face, and said something very disturbing to the other kid. He grinned in a very creepy way and said, I'd love to get rid of you, and then watch the worms eat you slowly. A cold shiver ran down my spine hearing him say that. When we came home, I wanted to talk to Pam about what just happened at the park. I was looking for her all over the house when I heard her voice in the backyard. Andrew, are you guys home? I went there and found Pam dragging a dead pigeon from the ground. The bird's neck was broken and it had started to rot. A foul stench was in the air. What the hell is that? I was mowing the lawn when I found this dead bird buried behind this tree. It's weird how it ended up here. Daniel's grinning face flashed right in front of my eyes, and I recalled this morning when he was washing his hands. I went close to Pam and said, Pam, I think there's something wrong with this kid. Today at the park. What? What are you saying? Do you think a five-year-old did this? How could you even say that, Andrew? He's our son, I know, but you won't believe what he said to this kid today. I feel like we should call the orphanage and find out more information about Daniel. There's something not right. Mommy, is everything all right? I turned back and found Daniel standing behind me with his expressionless face. He was staring dead into my eyes like I made him angry. Pamela ignored my words and went inside with him. I couldn't sleep that night. I slowly got up and went to check on him. I opened the door to his room, but he wasn't there. Is there anything you want to ask me, Daddy? Shaking with a sudden scare, I turned back and saw Daniel standing at some distance from me. He had his hands behind his back. His eyes were wide, and the blue eyeballs looked scarier than ever. What, what are you doing up so late? Don't you like me, Daddy? What? No. I mean, why would you say that? Then why would you want to get rid of me? Daniel, I never said that. Go to your bed. Now. I can smell your fear, Daddy. <laughs> Saying this, he came at me at full speed with a huge kitchen knife that he was hiding behind him. It all happened so unexpectedly that before I could defend myself, Daniel lunged at me and stabbed me in the foot. I collapsed on the floor, screaming in pain. 
Blood started to flow out deep from my cut. Pam came out hearing my scream, and Daniel began to behave like a lunatic. Why would you want to get rid of me? I never harmed you two, even though the voices in my head told me to. I love you and mommy. Why do you not want me? Oh my God, what is happening here? Daddy doesn't want me, Mom. This is why we have to get rid of him. And I know you love me. I know you will care for me no matter what. Let's get rid of Daddy so that we can live happily. No, baby, no. Daddy loves you. Daddy only needs time to understand you. None of us is ever going to get rid of you. Come here. Come to Mommy. I watched Pam take Daniel into her arms. She then brought the first aid kit and started to dress my wound. Daniel just stood there watching me with that same cold stare. After dressing my wound, Pam held my hand and said, Please, Andrew, he is our son. He needs us. Are you out of your mind? He just attacked me with a knife. Don't you? I was broken once, but you fixed me. You gave me hope. You stood beside me till I found my courage. Daniel is broken too, and we can both fix him. We need to support him with our love and care. His first parents didn't treat him right. The second one got scared and wanted to get rid of him. That's why he burned down their house. I mean, he was just sad. He's just a little kid. What? He killed them? No. I just wanted to stop them from sending me back to the orphanage. I wanted them to be my family. At that moment, I couldn't decide what was crazier. A five-year-old showing psychopathic traits after going through a tormented past, or my wife wanting to raise a child, ignoring his twisted mindset. I don't know what happened, but I couldn't push away Daniel anymore. We are living in the same house as a happy family now. Daniel and I are coming close each day, but sometimes when he gets angry, he acts up and dead birds end up in our backyard. That kid in the park fell from the wood house one day. Daniel was in there with him, but I know he didn't just do it for fun. I mean, you all can get angry, but that kid had it coming. He pushed Daniel first, right? But I'm sure he will change with time. He will change with our love and care. This is our only chance to be a happy family, and I'm not going to screw that up again. I will protect Daniel and try my best to keep him out of trouble. He is just a poor kid, but he can do better. I know he can. Right? Rachel and I had pretty much a perfect life, at least at first. We were high school sweethearts, married at 18, good jobs after college, a house, even a little yard with a pretty white fence. We were happy, and I was head over heels for my wife. Rachel was that stereotypical small-town beauty, blonde and blue-eyed, a former cheerleader with a laugh that would lift the room. But she was kind, too. Any free time she had, she was out volunteering. I never figured out what she saw in me exactly, but I knew better than to question it. But then, right as our lives were taking off, we made a decision to start a family. That's when it all derailed. After months of trying without success, we both got tested. The doctor told Rachel that she'd never be able to conceive. The light went out of Rachel. She stopped eating, stopped sleeping. All the joy just drained out of her like color from a faded photograph. The day I found her passed out on the kitchen floor from lack of food was the day we decided to adopt. That's where Benny came in. We must have toured a dozen orphanages, but no kid ever connected with us like Benny. He was older than we thought we were looking for. 
The agency wasn't sure because Benny's records were lost in a fire, but they estimated he was 10 or 11 years old. He was short for his age, maybe four foot six, and so very thin. Benny had blonde hair and blue eyes, just like Rachel, and he had a quick smile that stayed with us after our first meeting like an echo. The first week after we adopted Benny was one of the best periods of my life. Rachel was bright and alive and vivid again, like I hadn't seen her in months. However, there were some oddities about Benny that soon became apparent. For one thing, he was obsessed with Rachel. While Benny was polite to me, I quickly got the impression that he considered me a third wheel in the household. He called me by my name, Frank, but he called Rachel, Mommy. I could see how happy Rachel was, and I didn't have it in me to cast any shadow on her. Her and Benny spent mornings together in the kitchen baking and took long afternoon walks in the forest or spent that time sitting in the garden holding hands. I would watch them from the porch while they sat on a stone bench near the sunflowers. Benny was deeply clingy towards Rachel and would sometimes act out if she wasn't paying enough attention to him. Once she walked outside to water the garden without him, Benny began to <laughs> sob, while Rachel ran back to comfort him, reaching for his cheek to wipe his tears away. He bit her hand. I wanted to punish him, but she wouldn't let me. She said he was just scared and sensitive. This wasn't the only incident, however, if Benny thought my wife wasn't completely focused on him, he'd yell or sulk or occasionally even pull her hair. It got to the point where I had to sit him down privately without Rachel around. I told him that if I caught him hurting mom one more time, there would be severe consequences. I never saw him do it again, but I have a hunch Benny still lashed out when I wasn't around and my wife just didn't tell me. Benny spent a lot of time in the bathroom every morning and he hated to be disturbed. If I so much as knocked on the door to ask if he needed help, he'd lash out and scream that I was violating his privacy. As the weeks went on, Benny became increasingly hostile towards my presence in the house and far more clingy to Rachel. My wife seemed happy to have the boy following her heels and cuddling in bed at night, so I tried my best to adapt. One other thing about Benny that bothered me was his absolute refusal to go to the doctor. He appeared both terrified and furious about the idea of a standard checkup. Rachel eventually talked him into going for a basic visit and blood work, but only if I stayed home so they could go together. By that point, I was beginning to get frustrated enough with the boy that Rachel could sense my anger. The day of the doctor's visit, I decided I was tired of Benny's secrets. I waited for him to start his usual hour-long bathroom routine. After 30 minutes, I used a pen to open the simple pin lock on the bathroom door. I pressed it open just a few inches, not looking to catch the boy in an awkward spot, just wondering what he was up to. But what I saw shocked me. Benny was standing on a stool, leaning over the sink, looking into the mirror. Half of his face was covered in shaving cream, and he was holding one of my old-fashioned straight razors, a gift from my grandfather. When he heard the door, Benny turned and we made eye contact. His face cycled from surprise to fear to rage all in an instant. I slammed the door as he began to shriek. I would have chalked the whole thing up to Benny just wanting to play pretend to try out fake shaving, except for the glimpse I got of his cheek, the one that was still covered in shaving cream. I noticed a thick gray stubble in a few spots along his jaw and neck. I immediately went to find Rachel, but by the time I brought her back to the bathroom, Benny was done shaving and was curled on the floor crying. Rachel didn't believe me when I said I saw stubble. She told me Benny was probably just playing grown-up and that I should be ashamed for violating his privacy. 
Benny didn't talk to me for the rest of the day. Neither did Rachel. They just sat out in the garden watching bees float from flower to flower. I slept on the couch that night and Benny and Rachel were gone to the doctor's office before I woke up. Instead of waiting around at an awkward house, I decided to take a day just for myself. I packed up my rods and tackle box and headed down to the lake for some fishing. Rachel and I had both taken a leave of absence from work to settle Benny in, but I was already counting down the days until I returned to the office. Until then, it was fine fishing weather and I spent hours standing on a small bridge trying to entice trout. I got a call from Dr. Bradshaw around lunchtime. Frank, are you home? Bradshaw asked. I'm out at the lake, Doc. What's up? You need to go home. Now. I was in my truck and on the road in 60 seconds. Bradshaw stayed on the line while I drove. He explained that he'd given Benny his checkup that morning and immediately saw some red flags. The boy was uncooperative and had unusually elevated vitals. Bradshaw was barely able to get blood drawn before Benny drew a tantrum. The doctor asked the lab to rush the results and couldn't believe what he saw when they came back. Benny isn't 10 or 11, Frank, Bradshaw told me as I raced home. The boy is at least 45. His tests show, well, they're off the charts for a kid. I've seen similar conditions twice before. Something likely interfered with Benny's puberty and left him stuck in a child's body, despite his actual age. 45? I asked, pulling into the driveway. At least, the doctor confirmed. And Frank, I'm calling you directly because I've already tried Rachel, and I can't reach her. The rest of Bradshaw's sentence was cut off as I left my phone in the truck and sprinted towards my house. The door was unlocked. I found Rachel and Benny in their usual spot in the garden. My screaming must have been loud enough for Bradshaw to hear on the other end of the phone because the paramedics showed up before I could even gather myself to call them. Benny must have known that Dr. Bradshaw was on to him. His final act was to get my wife out and into the garden. Then, he took the same straight razor he had shaved with, and he slit her throat from ear to ear from behind. As she lay dying, Benny then used a razor to cut open Rachel's stomach. He climbed in as far as he could, squeezing himself in between organs and ribs and lungs. Benny got comfortable, then finally turned the razor on himself, slashing his wrists down to the bone. That's how we found them. Little Benny curled up, but protruding from Rachel's stomach like a baby that had chewed its way out of the womb. I'd almost given up on love. After five years of pointless scrolling, it was time to face the facts. Girls just weren't interested in nice guys like me. But then a notification popped up one morning. It's a match. Irene had soft eyes and curling brown hair that fell on her shoulders. Her smile was shy with just a hint of mischief. I thought long and hard about my opening line. It had to be both strike and the proper tone and make her feel special. Hi, you seem interesting, like someone I'd like to get to know better, not like all the other girls on here. She replied a few minutes later. That's so sweet of you to say. You seem pretty interesting yourself. Do you live alone? After a flirtatious back and forth, I asked her out to dinner. I'd love to, but I'm working late. I'll be so hungry when my shift ends. If only I knew a handsome gentleman who would cook. I waited almost a full minute before replying, so as not to appear desperate. Why don't you come over to my place? I'm a great cook. Irene replied, sounds good. Boom. Just like that, I had a date. I bought a mop and a vacuum to clean the apartment with and lit a few candles to set the mood. Irene messaged me at about 10 p.m. I'm outside. 
She was early. There was no time for a shower, and I couldn't find a single can of deodorant. Luckily, I'd bathed three days earlier. Crisis averted. And the CD player, I put on Avatar The Last Airbender original soundtrack and then dimmed the lights. I made my way to the front door, stopping at the mirror to straighten my tie, then turned the handle. Whenever I saw Irene, my heart skipped a beat. Her gray-green eyes glimmered like emeralds, and her intoxicating aroma reminded me of a freshly opened pack of Pokemon cards. She was wrapped in multiple layers of clothing, barely showing any skin at all. A rare virtue in a Western woman. Aren't you gonna invite me in? She eventually said. Her voice was confident, yet somehow submissive. I swept my hand across the apartment and tipped my fedora. Milady. Irene kept her coat on as I guided her towards the dining room. She took a seat at my Secret Lab Omega 2020 series gaming chair while I sat facing her on a wooden one that the previous owners left behind when they moved out. I asked Irene about her work, her family, and her sexual history. She gave short, curt answers to all of my questions. Periodically, her stomach growled. It was rather unladylike, although I held my tongue. She surveyed the room. Are we alone? Yep, I smiled. Just the two of us. Her eyes focused on mine. Perfect. The way she said it set my heart racing. At one point, I excused myself to begin preparing the meal. Then we resumed chatting. As we talked, Irene propped her head up using her arm and leaned forward seductively. What's that thing? With a gloved hand, she gestured past my left shoulder towards a katana mounted across the wall. Oh, that. It's a Japanese sword, crafted by a master smith in Yokohama, I said. I turned back towards her. If you're lucky, perhaps I'll give you a little demonstration later. A few minutes later, right as I was in the middle of explaining Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life, the microwave dinged. Excuse me? I served Irene's portion first, bowing as I laid it before her. Bon appetit. The Hot Pockets turned out sweet and delectable, a thick celebration of cheese, meat, and vegetables. But while I scoffed mine down, Irene only eyed her plate with disdain. I swallowed a mouthful. Is everything okay? She bit her bottom lip and nodded as her stomach grumbled, even louder than before. I shrugged and continued eating. By the time I was finished, she'd hardly taken a single bite. What's the matter? I asked, a tone of concern in my voice. She rubbed her belly. I'm not really in the mood for... Her voice trailed off as she's prodded the hot pockets with her fork. I'm in the mood for... something else. She stood, circling the computer desk, and gently pressed a finger against my lips. Before I knew it, we were kissing. Irene swung over on my lap. Our tongues acted in perfect synchronization, like Goku and Vegeta performing the fusion dance. Anticipation swelled beneath my cargo shorts. I'd been looking forward to this moment for 36 years. Irene bit my bottom lip, hard. I grimaced with pain and pulled back. Then, a trickle of blood ran down my chins. She gave me a nasty smile, showing a mouthful of curved teeth and licked her lips with a forked tongue. Mmm, you taste good. Irene stood and began undressing. For a moment, it appeared as though things were looking up. Although her monstrous teeth were repulsive, I still considered Irene attractive. But then, before my horrified eyes, her clothes fell to the ground. From the neck down, Irene's body was covered with a translucent skin, grotesquely colored, stretched taut over well-defined bones. Bat-like wings spanning no less than three times the width of her body expanded. She then pulled off her gloves, revealing long, sharp claws. A set of small, yet perfectly shaped breasts sat atop her chest. My knees trembled as Irene leaned close, 
Before I could react, her cold claw wrapped around my neck and lifted me from my chair, pinning me against the wall. I made a faint rasp and tried to pry her fingers off my neck. Irene's tongue probed my face as she moaned with what I assumed to be feminine delight. The edges of my vision blurred and my temples started throbbing. Desperately, I felt along the wall, probing for something, anything that could help. My left hand touched something metal. The katana. In one smooth motion, I grabbed it off the wall and angled it downward. The sheath fell onto the floor. Irene's jaw closed around my neck, puncturing my flesh. I screamed, then twisted the blade around and thrust it into her back, right between the shoulder blades. She made a sudden cry of pain and relinquished her grasp. Irene whirled around, shrieking. The blade tore a strip of flesh as... Before I could strike a second time, Irene flapped her wings. The left one collided with my chest, knocking me clean across the table. The jolt of the impact made me groan. Red lines trickled down my neck, stemming from the point where Irene bit me. I scrambled back to my feet, katana in hand. Irene bared her fangs. The computer desk stood between us. Why you? She said with fury. Green blood blossomed on her back. I took several short, quick breaths. What the fuck is going on here? I stammered. Isn't it obvious? A horrible grin broke out on Irene's face. The end of the blade wobbled in my unsteady hand. She circled to my right. I turned to follow, keeping the desk between us. I'm here to eat you. I stalk dating sites for horny losers like you, and then I gobble them up. Irene burst forward. A desperate flip of my blade sent her whining back. I gulped. Gobble up. Just what the hell are you? Explain yourself. Irene leaned forwards. It doesn't matter what I am. All that matters is what you are. Oh, I said then gulped. And what's that? She grinned. A fat 36-year-old virgin who's about to be dinner. Like hell I'm about to be dinner, I shouted. I tried a slash, but Irene jerked back, just out of reach, and the silver blade cut only air. She took another swipe at me. I backstepped. She swiped again and again, finding only the space above the desk. I held my breath and steadied my arms. All I had to do was to watch my opponent for an opening. Each time Irene got ready to strike, her muscles tensed. That was it. The next time her muscles contracted, a delicate stroke sent her fingers flying through the air. She growled like a wounded orc and staggered back. When Irene clutched her hand and squealed, I slipped around the desk, ready to deliver a finishing blow. Her eyes focused on me with murderous intent. With her uninjured hand, Irene lashed out, forcing me backwards. I answered her attacks with strikes of my own. Once, twice, attesting. There was a loud whoosh as Irene spread her wings and flew forward. No! I screamed. Swinging wildly, the blade cut across her stomach. Anguished wails followed. Irene hit me with a meaty thump, and we both spilled onto the floor. The katana landed between us. We both grabbed for it at the exact moment, me getting there first. I rose. Irene looked up at me, my blade poised, calm, and ready. Green liquid pumped out of the deep wound in her stomach. She clutched it with both hands, jaw clenched. She was defeated. We both knew it. Her strength was no match for my prowess. Those countless hours of cutting open bottles of Mountain Dew in my mom's backyard had not been in vain. Irene stumbled to her feet. Glistening green blood and ribbons of taut flesh dangled from where my strikes had connected. I held the katana firm with both hands. Irene's wings collapsed back into her. 
Then she began pulling on her clothes. Still only half dressed, she made her way towards the door. There, she looked back towards me with a look of utter disdain. I chuckled in response. The door crashed shut behind her. In the bathroom, I unrolled toilet paper and dabbed my wound. I stared at my reflection with pure disbelief. What were the odds that my first date ever would turn out to be a hideous monster? It had undoubtedly been the second worst date of my life. On the counter, my phone chimed. It's a match. Excitement swelled in my stomach. The girl I matched with, Alice, was even more beautiful than Irene. Her skin was like mocha cappuccino. Very exotic, very sexy. Sitting down to a feast while the still warm hot pockets Irene had forgotten, I sent Alice a message. Hi, you seem interesting, like someone I'd like to get to know better. Not like all the other girls on here. If I had known further terrors lay ahead, I would have uninstalled the app right then and there. But like a fool, I didn't. After all, what were the odds of something like that happening again? I saw Hazel on Tinder. Her profile was in a league of its own. Her pictures were beyond perfection. Her profile bio, talking about her previous experience working in bars and studying painting at Wisconsin College, she was beautiful. I swiped yes, hoping it would match us. And it did. I couldn't believe my luck. I wanted to keep it cool, so I didn't message her too quickly. After an entire day, I said, hey. No reply came. I started to panic. Shit, I must have messed it up. I went through all the possible ways I could have ruined this. Hey, should I have said hi? Sup? Too late now. An hour passed. My phone vibrated. A Tinder notification from Hazel. Hey. Success. Thus, we began talking, discussing our hobbies, interests, previous relationships, the lot. After a few days of talking, I felt like I knew this girl inside and out. Her parents had separated and she lived with her dad, taking on two jobs to support herself and him. She was a Leo, so was I. It was going great. It got to the point where one night I texted her, any chance we could meet up at some point? Get a drink or a coffee? Sure. My heart raced. I didn't think she would have said yes. We exchanged numbers and continued texting for a while, arranging to meet at Mighty Night, a cocktail bar in Wisconsin. 8 p.m. that night, I got off the bus and started walking towards the bar, my heart beating and palms beginning to sweat. What if she thought I was ugly, I kept thinking. I approached the entrance of the bar, arranging to meet her here before we went in. This is where it got weird. She didn't text me much that day, just short sentences and long amounts of time between responses. I just assumed she was nervous. As I waited outside the bar, suddenly my phone vibrated. It was a text from Hazel. Babe, I just walked past you. You're so much more beautiful in person. I was too nervous to say hi. Please forgive me. I looked up from the phone and scanned the street around me. Just a few students and some elderly people coming home from the theater. Where are you? I want to meet you. I texted. No response. I texted again. You winding me up? LOL. And still nothing. Maybe I got catfished. I mean, this girl couldn't possibly be intimidated by me. She was too attractive to be. My phone bleeped. Please forgive me. Now, I was starting to get pretty creeped out. The combination of the darkness and a lack of people in the streets didn't help. I kept looking around to try and see her. Then, out of the corner of my eye, on the other side of the road, and further down the street, a silhouette of someone standing facing me. It was too dark to make out any features of the person. I just noticed a long black jacket with the hood up. 
It couldn't have been her. I slowly reached into my pocket and sent her a blank text. My gaze still firmly on this figure. A phone lit up in its hand. Screw this, I said to myself and started walking the other way. A quick text popped up. Why are you walking away? Am I not pretty? That was it for me. I knew I had been played. I felt like a complete idiot. All I could think about was getting back home and forgetting this ever happened. Another text came. I am a pretty girl. You will see. That made my skin crawl. I refused to respond to it. All I could picture was some strange woman texting me now. The aura of Hazel was instantly gone. The whole way home, I felt like I was being followed. I don't know if it was just my paranoia or if someone was. Either way, I had to get home. I lunged through the front door, locking it and checking all the windows and back doors were locked. I needed to get some sleep. It took me a while to drift off, my mind still replaying that figure standing there. 4 a.m. I awoke to the vibration of my phone, the immediate brightness blurring my vision. As my eyes adjusted to the screen, I looked at the notification. It was her again, Hazel. My blood froze. I opened the message. It took me a second to process what I was looking at. It was a picture message, a picture message from Hazel. My blood went cold. On my screen was a picture of my bedroom from the door. I can see myself sleeping on the very bed I'm laying on now. Written under the photo was a message. Hello, my sleeping beauty. My eyes quickly looked at the bedroom door, which was now open wide. I remembered very well that I closed it before going to bed. The light from the hall had illuminated part of my room. I sat up in my bed almost instantly, head now facing the door. The hair in the back of my neck stood up when I saw a black shadow in my room at the end of the hallway. Each second, my heart beat twice. Slowly, a man in a dirty, ripped, knee-length pink dress came out from the dark and stood right opposite to me. A five-foot, extremely elderly, bit overweight guy wearing a blonde wig and what I could make out to be pink eyeshadow and red lipstick. His eyes were wide and fixated on me. The room was silent, and all I could hear was his heavy breathing. I looked in horror at this figure standing not five meters away from me. I couldn't move. I couldn't speak. I just sat there on my bed in complete terror. The man took a step forward so he was in better vision, his drooling mouth shaped into an abnormally large cartoon smile. Don't you think I'm pretty? He said in a hoarse voice. His mouth started grinning. Words tried forming in my head, but none of them would come out. I couldn't speak or move. My heart was going into overload. Who, who, who are you? I could hear the fear in my voice. I couldn't think properly. My legs were numb. The figure just stood there, eyes penetrating my soul. His smile grew larger, saliva dripping down his smudged lipstick. I'm Hazel, and I'm a pretty girl. My body started trembling in fear. I had no idea if the man was unarmed or not. I realized it was me versus him now. No one was coming to save me until I call the cops. My house is on the outskirts of the city. There's nothing but paddy fields and cow farms and the three to four kilometers stretch around my house. That was the first time I regretted not living in a crowded neighborhood. You didn't answer my question. Am I not pretty? Look, please, it was all a misunderstanding. You need to leave, or else what? You won't kiss me. I'm warning you, for the last time, 
Get out of my house, or I'm calling the cops. <laughs> and how would you call them? Using your girly voice. The man slowly lifted his hand, and I saw a screwdriver in his hand. I realized that this is his choice of weapon, because the tool didn't belong to me. He brought it himself. The man licked his lips from left to right, and then again from right to left, and then held the screwdriver up and started licking it from the bottom to the top in a very vulgar manner. I've never felt so gross in my entire life. He then started to come to my bed while laughing like a mentally disabled person. <laughs> I like you. Let me love you. Then you will like me too. I promise, Jonathan. Just let me love you. We can enjoy the whole night together, doing all kinds of naughty things to each other. <laughs> He then jumped on my bed to grab me with his filthy hands, but I was prepared. I jumped and got out of my bed and ran out of my room. He couldn't catch me, but started chasing me while cursing at me in the worst possible way. I was almost near the door when he stabbed the screwdriver in my back. I screamed in pain. I collapsed on the floor and he moved back. He started to laugh hysterically like we were playing some funny game. He then lifted his pink dress like a princess and started skipping around in a circle while staring at me and singing. Ring around the rosy, a pocket full of posies, ashes, ashes, we all fall down. While he behaved in this crazy way, I somehow pulled the screwdriver from my back. Seeing this, he ran at me. But this time, I got him. I stabbed him in his cheek, and the screwdriver hung from his cheek like a big-ass piercing. He bled like hell while crying in pain. I slowly took out my phone from my pajama pocket and dialed 911. Being old and severely injured at the same time, the man just sat on the floor holding his bleeding face. I got up and grabbed a knife from the kitchen counter. I raised it to him and warmed him with an angry stare. I swear I'll chop your fucking nuts off if you take one step at me. He didn't say anything. He just kept staring like an injured wolf. The cops came and arrested him. They said he was one of the notorious pedophiles who assaulted and murdered two young boys in his 30s. He was locked up in a mental institution from where he escaped a week ago. The cops had no idea how he possessed a phone and decided to use Tinder to trap new victims. When the cops were taking him away, he looked at me one last time and said, I will think about rubbing myself to you while sitting in the electric chair. <laughs> My pretty boy. I took a job at a Burger King outlet located on the deserted highway. It was mostly boring as very few customers stopped by the outlet, but this one time, things didn't go the way they were expected. It was a Saturday night. The owner left after cashing up and I was on my own. There'd been no customers for hours. The air was hot and heavy. A storm was on the way. I unstuck my sweat-soaked t-shirt from my back and wished it would hurry up. I watched the empty highway from the glass window next to me. Everything was quiet when a truck drove by at full speed and I could hear an odd squishy sound. My mood darkened further when I saw what the truck had left behind, the pathetic remains of a fox. I wandered over to it to see if it was still alive. I was going to put it out of its misery. It was soon obvious that there was no need. A gash ran the length of its belly and its innards glistened in the flickering light of the diner's neon sign. This thing was roadkill. I walked to it and using the tip of my boot, rolled it off to the side of the road where there was no danger of it getting hit again and turning into a nauseating smear. 
I knew that by morning its flesh would be picked clean by other animals that lived out in the woods. That's death, I thought, and headed back to the counter. As I entered the restaurant, I saw a man, dressed like the Burger King mascot, standing near the counter. As the doorbell alerted him about my entrance, his face turned towards me, and he said in a heavy voice, I thought everybody died here. (laughs) Not only was his laugh creepy, but the statement he just made was uncanny as well. I gave an awkward smile and said, Uh, what do you want to order, friend? I'm not your friend. Call me King. I realized he's too much into the character. Without argument, I took down his order. He ordered fries, a burger, and a soda. Uh, Will that be all? Maybe the keys to the washroom. The restroom's unlocked. Go ahead, King. He went to the washroom, and I turned towards the grill to prepare the order. Ten minutes later, the food was laid out and ready to eat, but there was no sign of the customer. Bad guts, I figured. Only another fifteen minutes, with the food close to cold, I decided to investigate. I walked to the washroom and knocked on the door. Um, your food's here, mister. No answer came. After a few seconds, the doorknob rattled and the man got out. There was something weird about him this time. His eyes were bloodshot and his lips were excessively red. He stared at me and then went to his table. As he walked past me, a foul stench came from him, which I didn't notice the first time. After sitting at his table, he looked at his burger with a very disturbing grin and then looked back at me. He then inserted his hand into his left pocket and took out a bundle of bloody entrails. So this is where the smell came from. The entrails belonged to a small animal, and I was shocked to see that this man was roaming around with it in his pocket. I couldn't hold back anymore. What the hell is that? Your king's food. Are you crazy? How dare you talk to me like that? Before I could reply, he lifted the burger bun and placed the entrails over the patty. Dude, are you seriously going to eat that? Every king has their special favorite meal. Mine is roadkill. There's nothing more delicious than fresh roadkill. <laughs> My head turned to the highway immediately. I recalled the dead fox that I moved away from the street. So that lump of raw flesh belongs to that animal? The man grabbed the burger with his dirt-filled, long, filthy nails and started to feast on it like he hadn't eaten for days. Every bite he took, he chewed, making a loud sound like a zombie eating with no control. I was taken back by all this and forgot to speak. He finished the burger. Then he licked the blood that smeared his lips. I ran to the washroom as my stomach was churning and I could feel bile rushing to my throat. I went to the sink to puke and things got worse. The white sink was filled with blood that someone tried to wash off. So. This is why he was taking so much time. He literally picked up the entrails from the dead fox, brought it in, and washed off the dirt in this Burger King washroom. This guy is a psycho. Suddenly, a huge bang took place, and I heard a car alarm going off like crazy. I came out and saw the man wasn't in the restaurant anymore. Then, I noticed a blue car on the side of the road crashed into a big tree. The man dressed as the Burger King mascot was now standing near the car and watching something. I walked to him and found a woman lying dead in the driver's seat. She somehow lost control and hit the tree. For not wearing seatbelts, her head bashed on the steering wheel so hard that her face smashed terribly. 
it was hard to tell how she looked exactly. I looked at the man and saw him looking at the dead woman with a sinister grin. He looked at me and said, I've never tasted human roadkill. Maybe it's time to try something new. <laughs> Saying this, he opened the driver's side door of the car and lunged on the dead woman's face and started to lick the blood off of her face. I vomited right there. My head started to throb in pain and I fainted on the road. I woke up hearing loud sirens. As I opened my eyes, a flash of red and blue lights blurred my vision. Officer, Officer Brooks, he's awake. As my senses started to normalize, I found myself lying inside an ambulance and a cop sitting right next to me, staring at my face with confused eyes. What, what happened? Another tall cop came to the ambulance and I slowly got up on the stretcher. He said in a firm voice, Do you work at that Burger King outlet? Ye yes, I do. Can you tell us who killed that woman? Saying this, he pointed out at the crashed car. I said in a panicked voice, Killed? What are you saying? She died in an accident. Her car crashed into that big tree. That's why I came out of the restaurant. Really? Then why is half of her face missing? What? Someone cut off her face, and I don't think an animal could do that. I sprung out and went to take a look. The cops tried to stop me, but I didn't listen. As I peeked into the car, I saw the woman. She didn't look the same. I saw her the first time, and the cops were right, but I knew something they didn't. Her face wasn't cut off, rather eaten by a madman. I told them everything, and they retrieved the camera footage from the restaurant as well, where the man could be seen walking in and doing all that crazy stuff he did. I just hope they catch him soon, because I don't think he's going to wait for road kills anymore to satisfy his sick hunger. I was 20 and trying to pay my own way through summer trade school semesters by working all winter. Finding enough work was tough, but my uncle got me a job on this crew doing demolition work for an old office building. The guy I was replacing got cute cutting corners and fell off a roof with no safety harness, broke both collarbones and would be recovering for at least two months. First day on the job site was bitterly cold, February 20th. The air had this weird oppressive feeling and the wind cut right through my coat and vest. We had to work overtime because the storm caused a few days of snow removal before we can get back to tearing down the masonry. The bosses wanted as much done as possible, so we were there till nearly midnight. The last few hours of my shift, the snow started and soon visibility was down to almost zero. Finally, the foreman told us to get lost, and I clocked out. I was hungry as fuck, so I wanted to grab a bite before catching the last bus of the night to get back to my tiny apartment. No one else was around. I didn't really know anyone yet, and I guess they just took off. I saw Wendy's across the street with an open sign in the window and headed over. The streets were deserted, and with the blowing snow, it looked like the whole city was battening down the hatches. The parking lot was empty, and there were no lights inside the restaurant, but I pushed the door anyway, and it opened. Inside, the power was off. One skinny teenager stood in front of the register. I was about to leave when he beckoned me over. Well, looks like you got no power, I said stupidly. He nodded. The gas still works. I can take your order. He paused after each word, and I decided he was most likely high. I shrugged and ordered a double cheeseburger. I grabbed my wallet, but he shook his head slowly. He gestured to the dark cash register. I can't ring it. 
It's on the house. I thanked him and waited. In the back, I could see nothing but darkness. I spotted a shape moving back there. I was squinting my eyes, trying to make out more, when a hand emerged and handed the cashier my burger and fries. Here you go, the stone-sounding teenager said. I took my food and sat at a table. Nobody else was in there besides me, and the snow was so thick outside, I couldn't even see the job site across the street. The table was coated in dust. I wiped it off, thinking that they must be short-staffed because of the blizzard. The cashier stared at me in a creepy way, but I ignored him and started to chow down. People acted strange when they were wasted. Nothing new there. The burger was hot and juicy, just the way I like it. After I finished, I dumped the trash and headed back out. When I got to the door, I looked back and saw the cashier was gone. He must have went into the back for a break, or maybe he was heading home. It didn't look like there would be any more customers tonight. I went to the bus stop, and by luck, the bus arrived just a few minutes later. There were only three other people at the bus stop, and I noticed an old lady looking at me funny every once in a while. It took about half an hour to get to my stop. When I got up to get off the bus, a few people shrank back from me as if they were afraid. But I didn't think much of it. You had to be careful around strangers nowadays. When I got up to my apartment, I took off my work coat and vest and pulled off my steel-toed boots. I went to take a piss, and that's when I saw my reflection in the mirror. There was blood all around my mouth and down my chin. A trail of red that also spread all over my white t-shirt. What the fuck? I must have bit my lip or cheek or something, I thought. I opened my mouth and there was no pain and nothing bleeding. No wonder those people were staring. I cleaned myself up and went to bed. Two days later, I came back to work, and Charlie, the dude I was manning the wheelbarrow with, asked me where I went the other day after work. I said I grabbed a bite to eat. He told me they were looking for me and figured I'd be at the McDonald's a block away, because that's where everybody else went after work. I told him, no, I went to Wendy's instead, and he stared at me blankly. What Wendy's? I pointed across the street, but my mouth dropped open as I noticed the discrepant appearance of the building. It looked like it hadn't been open in ages. Nice one, Charlie said with a smile. That place is the next building we're tearing down. After what happened in there, no one will ever want to rent that space again. A chill went up my spine as I wondered who had taken my order, who had handed him the food, and exactly what it was I'd eaten there. Next time, I'll tell you about all the things that happened while we demolished that Wendy's, and what I found in the basement. But that's a tale for another day. I was standing outside the Sunrise Liquor Store with my friend Martin. We were tired of failing to convince a random stranger to buy us some beers when a man walked up to us from the alley behind the liquor store. He was dressed in a nice suit with a touch of gold in his hair and a toothpick in his mouth. Seems like you boys are having some trouble. His voice was somehow simultaneously gruff and silky, almost like two people talking at once. Um, yeah, you could say that. Is there a chance you could... I'd be happy to. I can imagine being a kid just trying to have some fun. What are you looking to get? Uh, just like a 30-pack of Keystone? I see. You like the good stuff. I reached into my pocket for the money, but he stopped me. Nah, you pay me when I get out of here with your stuff. Doing it your way will get you ripped off. I'll be right back. The man went into the liquor store. Martin remarked that there was something strange about the man. He wasn't outwardly threatening or anything, 
Be it in his personality or appearance, he was just almost too nice. But not in a perverted way either, it's difficult to explain. After a few minutes, the man returned with our beers. I handed him the cast saying, Thanks a lot, man. We appreciate it. I don't know why you put yourselves through this. Why don't you just get a fake ID? Well, I never had the best luck at them. Take my number down. When you can get the money together, you shoot me a text. I'll get you set up. And so I did. I was told the fake eye he provided me would cost $300, use my picture, and work if any store employee scanned it. On top of that, money wouldn't exchange hands until I had a chance to see the final product. I had a little money saved up, and the rest I got together from two paychecks from my shitty part-time job at Kmart. I rationalized the purchase by considering how I could effectively become the main distributor of alcohol for my school and recoup my money, something Martin agreed with. A week and a half after we first met, I texted the man with all the required details. He told me to meet him two days later for the ready product. I was waiting for him around that evening, standing near the same liquor store, when he appeared from the alley wearing a red t-shirt and jeans. Not identical, but undoubtedly similar to mine. Nevertheless, I was finally handed the most legitimate fake ID I'd ever seen. The name on the ID was Franco Millard, and the address was the one on the other side of town from where I lived. It had all the necessary holograms and other security features, and it seemed to be in perfect order. Take it for a spin. If it works, you pay me. If not, I'll buy you whatever you need and get to work on finding a new career I'm good at. <laughs> I agreed, but as I turned to walk into the store, he stopped me. Kid, your phone. Oh, right. I handed him my phone, walked in the Sunrise Liquor with a prayer and a fake ID, and walked out with a 30-pack of Keystone. I returned to the man, who stood in the alley with a warm smile. Are we good? Yeah, man. It worked perfectly. Thank you. I appreciate it. I set the beer down and dug in my back pocket for half of the money, and dug into each sock for a total of the remaining half and handed it over. Sorry if it's sweaty, I just figured I had to be careful to... It could smell like dog shit and baby shit had a baby of their own, and I'd still take it. Even smelly money spends. He smiled and gave me back my phone. I was put off by the odd comment for a moment, but it quickly passed. Alright, well, if any of your buddies need a fake, you know who to call. For sure, I'll let you know. Thanks again. Have fun with your new life. It was the last thing he said to me before he turned around to walk away. At that exact moment, something happened. I can't explain what it was. I felt weird, physically. As the man walked away, I called out to him, saying I never got his name. Instead of answering me, he just looked back and let out a creepy grin, and then walked away. I figuratively shrugged my shoulders, picked up my beers, and started making my way to Martin's house. Because I was such a regular presence, I'd been given my key and permission to be in the house when Martin or anybody wasn't home. That day, however, as I turned the corner to his street, I saw Martin's mom's car sitting in the driveway. I walked through the front door and made my way down the hallway into the kitchen. But as I entered the kitchen, Martin's mom turned around, and in an instant, the typical warm smile that I was always greeted with fell into a look of pure fear. Oh my god, please, don't hurt me. Take whatever you want. Uh, I, uh, what, what, I... Martin's mom kept her eyes trained on me while her right hand frantically traversed the countertop behind her, all while I stood there in shock, completely unsure of what was happening. Then her hand found a knife, she held it out in front of her, trembly. I... W Mrs. Smith! W what, what are you even doing? Get out! 
She screamed so loud it caused me to drop the case of beer. I'm calling the police. Don't you come any closer. I will kill you. Get out of my house. Jesus, what the? Okay. I dropped the beers on the floor and rushed out of my best friend's house. As I hurried down the street towards my own house a few blocks away, I pulled out my phone and called Martin. Hello? Dude, your mom just freaked out on me. She pulled a knife on me and chased me out of your house. There was a short silence. Uh, who is this? What the, what do you mean, who is this? It's James. Your mom just pulled a fucking knife on me. You got the wrong number. Good luck though, bloody freak. Martin cursed, then hung up the phone. I was beyond shocked at this point. What is wrong with everyone today? After a short walk, I found myself walking up to my front door. I entered the home I'd lived in since I was born and made my way to my room. I sat down on my bed and waited for Martin to call me back. Suddenly, my room door opened and a boy looking exactly like me walked in. He was my doppelganger, except he had a toothpick in his mouth and let out an evil smile as soon as our eyes met. He then winked at me and started screaming, Dad! Dad, help! And violently smashed his forehead into the door frame, immediately sending blood pouring from his wound as he laid on the floor between my room and the hallway. What happened next was a blur. I remember my dad screaming in terror as he saw his son on the floor with a pool of blood forming around him. I remember my dad's footsteps coming down the hall, but I don't remember seeing him coming into the room. I remember his fists, though. I remember him pummeling me into my bedroom floor until I was unconscious, something I think I let just happen because I was frozen. I remember the ambulance, and I remember the handcuffs. I remember bits and pieces of telling everyone the truth of what happened, of how I'd gone to the liquor store as a 16-year-old and then left as a man in his early 40s with a golden shade in his hair and I remember everyone looking at me like I was an idiot. I can't say I blame them. I remember looking in the mirror and seeing me, the true 16-year-old me, but asking several people to describe me and getting the exact description of the man from the liquor store. I remember getting so fed up and frustrated that I threw up. I remember the entire court process, which was over before it began. But most of all, I remember the day of sentencing. I was painted as a dangerous man who assaulted a 16-year-old child. Yes, it all sounds crazy, but it's true. I don't know what that man did to me, but he's now living my life. And here I am, sitting inside this dark cell, trying to make sense of how a couple of beers turned my life upside down. I'm a male nurse at a hospital, and you should pray to God every night that you never visit. Its name is Holy Cross Hospital. My job is patient care, but unlike every other hospital in the world, patient care comes second at Holy Cross. Self-preservation comes first. That's because we don't deal with things a regular hospital takes care of. We treat patients with mental disabilities those who are suffering from PTSD after a traumatic event, and all kinds of outlandish behavior resulting from the malfunctioning of the human brain. A teenager that tried to slit his wrist over his parents' divorce, a girl trying to get over a sudden death of her boyfriend, victims saved from a serious house fire were the kind of cases that stood out but were common to us. Among all these weirdly weird cases, I remember one particular patient. His name was Frank. He came in complaining of stomach pains. Obviously, like I said, nobody gets sent here to this hospital for regular stuff, so we knew it was something more. When he came in, he was clutching a half-eaten and rotting carcass of what looked like a cat. He was literally talking to us in between bites. It was a strange conversation. 
Sir, it, is this your cat? He lifted the half-eaten cat and looked at it and said, This? Oh, God, no. I wouldn't eat mittens. This is, well, I don't want to say. It's disgusting. The other nurse, Ava, and I exchanged looks. Sir, you're eating a cat. What can be more disgusting than that? I was kind of shocked that she said that because I was taught besides manners at my previous hospitals, but Ava had a point. I know it's a cat. You don't think I know that? It's roadkill, okay? Cats, deer, dogs, coons. I can't stop myself from eating whatever I see on the side of the road. Uh, I'm gonna throw up. He leaned over to puke, and what came next was even worse than what he just told me. He threw up, and a foul stench spread across the hallway. Ava ran to the dustbin close by and started to vomit too. Two more nurses came running. He threw the dead cat at me and started to become violent. His legs were tied to the stretcher so he couldn't get up from it. The two other nurses held his hands tight while he screamed. I need to feed. I'm hungry. I need something more delicious. I want human meat. <laughs> I want your meat. Take him to cell four. I'll be right there, Dr. Chen. Another nurse came and the three of them took him away. I walked to Ava and tried to distress her from all this. She calmed down in about 10 minutes. Then I went straight to Dr. Chen's room. She was sitting in her chair looking through some files. I knocked on her door and she asked me to come in. Without wasting a single second, I explained everything to her. She heard silently and then got up to head to Frank's cell. I followed her as well. When we reached outside cell four, we saw Frank jumping and punching the walls of the cell in a furious anger. He was punching the walls so hard that his knuckles bled. The skin on the tips of his fingers started to come off like a thin paper every time he hit the hard wall. There was no way we could get inside his cell at this point. Dr. Chen said in a calm voice, Frank, Frank. Hearing her voice, he stopped suddenly. He then walked up to the cell bars and tried to sniff the air, throwing a filthy stare at Dr. Chen. I bet you would be the most delicious of them all. Really, what makes you think that? You smell, I can smell your sweat. It's maddening, woman. Trust me, I could feel my skin crawl hearing him. But Dr. Chen wasn't easily flinched. She looked at him in the eye and said, But what if I taste bitter? Like, so bitter that you die right after taking one bite. Frank's face immediately changed. He never expected such an answer. His wide eyes blinked cluelessly, and then he slowly stepped back into his cell like a scared kid. Leaning his back at the wall, he sat down on the floor, bending his knees and hiding half of his face in them. Just his scared eyes watched us. I don't want to scare you, Frank. I want you to feel safe here. I promise if you listen to us, we will take full care of you. Do you understand me? Y yeah, yes. Very good. She then turned back at me and said, Prepare him for the ice bath. Well, like I said, this wasn't an everyday hospital. Like our unusual patients, we have an unusual way of treatments as well. And I'm just a nurse here. There's no way I can disobey Dr. Chen. I mean, patients are scared of her as far as I have seen. Behind her purple glassy eyes, lurks an unknown danger that only the patients can see. Maybe it was her odd method of treatment that makes her even more frightening to every patient that comes here. In the next few minutes, Ava and I cuffed Frank to a stretcher. Once we were done, we took him to the gallery. The gallery is a big marble room with a huge oval bathtub in the middle. It is always filled with freezing ice water. 
we hooked up Frank. He was staring with wide eyes and watching everything. We hooked a stretcher with two iron hooks hanging from the ceiling. Dr. Chen entered the room and Frank's eyes shifted at her. What is all this? This is your first medication at Holy Cross. What? What do you mean? The cold water will help you calm your mind. Trust me, Frank. It's for your own good. Saying this, she pulled a big shiny handle on the wall, and the machine dripped Frank right into the cold water. His scream got choked as soon as his body entered the piercing ice water. We could only see bubbles forming on the surface of the water, while Frank lay fully submerged. How fun is this, Frank? <laughs> Chen's spine-chilling laughter echoed in the room. I looked at the camera on the corner wall. She set it up when the room was built. These cameras are connected to the small LED screens of all the cells in the hospital. Every patient is made to watch these treatments. It's just our way of telling them how much we care about them. After two to three more dunks, Frank's body started to become unresponsive. He began to shiver. His teeth started to clutter while his eyes rolled back inside of his head due to shock. Dr. Chen dipped him one last time and then pulled up the handle. His drenched, cold body slowly lifted from the bathtub. When we laid him on the bed, he stopped breathing. Chen and I gathered near him. She looked at the body of a man who was once called Frank and then said to me, Maybe we gave him a little high dose. No issues. We will take care of that when the next patient comes. Get rid of this one through the incinerator. As she walked away, I watched her cruel face giving birth to a twisted smile. Ava and I looked at each other and then did what we do every time we lose a patient. I mean, it's not our hands to save someone who doesn't want to be saved, right? How can we tell when someone's going to die? The motto at Holy Cross Hospital is absolute cure, and we are determined to reach our goal someday. I just hope you don't turn up at our hospital. You definitely wouldn't want that, do you? <laughs>